Spain, 1478. A land where Christians, Muslims, and Jews have lived in tolerance for centuries. But that time is ending. A young king and queen bent on immortality proclaim themselves the Catholic monarchs and start an inquisition. Jews who had converted to Christianity are accused of secretly sabotaging the Christian faith. Thousands perish in a ritual called the Act of Faith. The assassination of the Inquisitor sets off a wave of reprisals. Mothers will die to protect their children, and the highest in the land will pay the ultimate price. It is the beginning of the Spanish Empire, and a long dark night that will last for centuries. The Iberian Peninsula in the Middle Ages is unique. Isolated from the rest of Europe by the impassable mountains of the Pyrenees, for more than a thousand years, Iberia has been home to a rich intermingling of cultures. Christians, Muslims, and Jews have lived side by side in Iberia for centuries, tolerant of each other in their convivencia, a practical coexistence. They sing each other's songs, they enjoy each other's cuisines, and they all play chess, a board game introduced by the Muslims. One 13th century king even calls himself the emperor of the three religions, and he commissions a folio of chess problems that reflects the multicultural nature of his kingdom. Convivencia set Iberia apart. Nowhere in Europe has a nation been so enriched with the gifts of different cultures in education, art, science, and medicine. But by 1478, times are changing in Iberia for the worse. A storm of horror is about to descend on the people. There will be no escape from its vicious web of interrogation, betrayal, torture, condemnation, and death. Soon, Jaime de Montesa, the highest judge in Zaragoza, will feel the terror of these changing times himself. And for love, Sinfa Kasavi and her husband will pay the ultimate price. The time of tolerance has passed. Iberia is in turmoil. Iberia is not yet the nation we know as Spain. The north is divided among the Christian kingdoms of Aragon, Castile, and Navarre. The Moors control the Muslim stronghold of Granada in the south. And there's a power struggle for the throne of Castile. One claimant to the kingdom of Castile is the 18-year-old Princess Isabella. Deeply pious, Isabella sees everything through the prism of her faith. She will become known as Isabella la Católica. Faith guides the citizens of the realm. 
Sinfa Kasavi is deeply pious too, but she is a Jew. Sinfa's visit to the mikveh, the ritual baths, is a sacred Jewish preparation for marriage. She submerges herself six times to purify herself so that God will bless and sanctify her with health, wisdom, and prosperity. The wedding was scheduled for the spring. Three days before my wedding, I took my bride's bath. I purified myself at the mikvah. Sinfa is about to marry her childhood sweetheart. Isabella is about to marry someone she's never met. It is a marriage she prays will unite the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon. Prince Ferdinand of Aragon runs a gauntlet of castles and forts held by enemy nobles. For his personal safety, the prince is disguised as a servant. Marrying Ferdinand will strengthen Isabella's chances to gain the throne of Castile. It will lead eventually to the unification of their kingdoms. The wedding of Isabella and Ferdinand, although politically motivated, is charged with all the passion and intrigue of an illicit affair. They are teenagers. She's 18, he's 17. Sinfa Kasavi and Jacob Abankuka married first as Christians in the cathedral. But now they have a second secret wedding in the Jewish tradition. From the transcript of Sinfa Kasavi. That day, we all met in my father's house, all my family and my sweetheart's family. They brought many presents. They filled my house with flowers and brought delicious meats for the meal of that day. All this was the prelude to the happiness, harmony, and peace that were awaiting us in our life together. The day I got married was the happiest of my life. I was very pretty. I was dressed in beautiful clothes. I was radiant with happiness. Jews have lived in Iberia for over a millennium, since the first arrived with the Roman legions. But since the 14th century, the Jews have come under attack from Catholic zealots. Thirteen ninety one, priests call for the compulsory conversion of the Jews. Riots against Jews spread across the land. Facing the choice, convert or die, the Jews must make life and death decisions on the spot. Many choose baptism and survival. Through the 1400s, following further pogroms and a series of increasingly restrictive laws, forcing the Jews to live in ghettos and wear distinctive clothing, nearly half the Jews of Iberia change faiths. The Jews who convert become known as New Christians, or conversos. Well, some people converted because they had swords to their throats and they had a choice of converting or dying. Uh, other people were offered uh, the opportunity of uh, social mobility or economic mobility. Many converted because they fell in love with someone who was Catholic, and uh, the only way they could uh, uh, marry them was to convert to Catholicism. The distinction between conversos and old Christians will be legally sanctioned in Spain for the next three and a half centuries. But in the 15th century, conversion offers opportunities for advancement to positions of power and prominence in the royal court that had been denied to Jews. The old Christians grow jealous of the conversos' success. By the 1450s, uh, Spanish Catholics discovered that the converts had become the new urban middle class. Uh, they were dominant in business, they were dominant in uh, some of the, the uh, uh, professions like uh, uh, being scribes and accountants, and they felt that they were being uh, railroaded by these upstarts. Fourteen seventy-eight, a royal baptism. 
Tu kanis. Finally, Isabella and Ferdinand can look forward to the unification of their two kingdoms. After eight years of marriage, they have a long-awaited son, Prince Juan, heir to Aragon and Castile. The event is seen as so important that chroniclers herald the baby Juan as the second messiah. In the home of conversos Constanza de Perpignan and Manuel de Almazan, a secret ritual takes place. Their child was baptized in the Christian manner at the cathedral when he was born. Now, eight days later, he is about to be circumcised according to Jewish tradition. But the ceremony is observed by an uninvited neighbor, Violant Ferrer, an old Christian. Now, Constanza de Perpignan's baby has a name. His parents will call him Yuse, but beyond these walls, he will be known by his Christian name, Pedro de Almazan. In time, the baby named this day will play a role in a defining moment of the Spanish Inquisition. Fourteen seventy-eight, the monarchs take up residence in the Alcazar of Seville, a palace built by the Moors, the Muslim rulers in the eleventh century. Isabella and Ferdinand are the power couple of their day. They dream of one state under one religion, Roman Catholicism. They have a big agenda: to unite their kingdoms in the name of national salvation, and to complete the Christian reconquest against the Muslims. Who still control the south after 700 years? But there is trouble inside their kingdom. A Dominican priest, Tomas de Torquemada, delivers a warning. In these kingdoms are many blasphemers, renegades from gods and the saints. The culprits, says Torquemada, are guilty of Judaizing. They are conversos, the new Christians, who continue to practice their Jewish traditions. He proposes a scheme to root out the heretics. An inquisition. The monarchs agree. November 1st, 1478, Pope Sixtus IV issues a bull creating the Spanish Inquisition. But Ferdinand and Isabella do not intend to let the Pope in Rome run their Inquisition, or share in the spoils. The institutionalized Inquisition came to be seen as an. A structure that could be adopted in varying ways by different countries. See, so in a way, it was natural, uh, speaking again in this sense, for the Spanish government to create an inquisition of its own. They appointed the inquisitors. They appointed the uh, the inquisitor general who ran the inquisition uh, with some nominal approval from Rome. But basically, the monarchy got a. Um, a tribunal that was run by the state, not by the church. The monarchs will hold the keys to the powerful engine that becomes the Spanish Inquisition. The record room is the memory of the Inquisition. Three keys entrusted to three inquisitors are needed to open its three locks. No file can be removed from this room without the knowledge of the others. They contain the records of investigations, of interrogations, of torture sessions. They are cross-referenced, and they will survive centuries. And there was an atmosphere of terror. 
uh, that took over in among the ranks of the converted Jews because they were always afraid of being denounced. May 1484. Despite the opposition in Aragon from the old Christian nobility and conversos alike, Ferdinand sends two inquisitors to Zaragoza, the capital of Aragon. One of them, Pedro Arbues, will become a saint, at least in the eyes of the church. Like many Spanish towns, Zaragoza has a large number of conversos. And for the conversos, every ritual in the cycle of life and death will come under scrutiny. They will be charged with heresy if the Inquisition hears that they are Judaizers, who continue to observe the Jewish customs of their ancestors. The Inquisition files are just filled with data about life cycle events, about how they buried their dead, about uh, issues of uh, uh, female hygiene, of, of uh, sexual practices, of every imaginable part of people's daily lives. I think it's very important to make the point that Jews were never the object of the Inquisition's investigations because Jews were not Christian. The Spanish Inquisition dealt only with baptized Christians. Sinfa Kasavi and her husband, Jacob Abankuka, are denounced as Judaizers by seven witnesses, people they have lived and worked with all their lives. The identities of their accusers will not be revealed. What is your name? Sinfa, Sinfa Kakavi. Do you know who is the accuser? I don't know anything, I'm innocent. Are you a Jew? Yes, I'm a Jew. A Jew is a crime. No, not a crime, I'm a Jew. Where is your God? But Sinfa has a clever defense. The Inquisition is charged with investigating Christians suspected of heresy. Jews are beyond the Inquisition's reach. They cannot be heretics because to the church they are infidels, unbelievers. When the Inquisitor demands she confess she is a heretic, Sinfa insists she is a Jew. We are Jewish. We live with Jews and we live as Jews. I was never baptized a Christian. And my husband is a Jew. Frustrated, the Inquisitor orders that Sinfa be tortured. Torture is sanctioned to obtain confessions as long as it is performed according to the rules set out in the Inquisitor's manual written a century earlier. Sinfa's feet are held to the fire, smeared with pig grease to accelerate her suffering. The crucifix in the Inquisitor's chamber is veiled, a holy procedure to protect Jesus from witnessing what will be done in his name. Under torture, Sinfa reveals exactly what the Inquisitor wants to hear. Yes, I am a Christian. I was born Christian. My name was Juana, and my father was Juan Gonzalez. Watching Sinfa's torture is too much for Jacob. The notary dutifully transcribes his words from the transcript of Jacob Abankuka. Remove her from the torture. My wife speaks the truth. Release her from the torture, Inquisitor. I will speak the truth as well. I am from Seville, of the Kingdom of Castile, and I was born a Christian. I had Jewish friends who were engaged before getting married in the synagogue, and I always dreamed of being able to do it myself. 
We were then husband and wife, according to the law of Moses. You just condemned yourselves. Your souls are already lost, and now you will lose your bodies. Jacob has just sealed his own fate. Sinfa will be spared for now. If I had been born Christian, I would have been happy now, and the Inquisition would not be after us. Sinfa gathers her strength and defiance. That was the happiest day of my life, and you can't take that away from me. The Inquisition said to people, you must confess if you are guilty of any kind of Judaizing. You have to confess if you know of someone who may know of someone who is guilty of Judaizing. And if you don't, you're guilty to the extent that they're guilty. And that just tore society apart. It will become normal for neighbor to spy upon neighbor, for relatives to turn each other in. Scores of anonymous accusers appear before Inquisitor Pedro Arbuez to denounce friends, relatives, even strangers. Constanza de Perpignan is among the hundreds who are denounced. There was salted pork lard at the table, and she did not want to eat it. When there were no maids around, and they asked for wine, they used to bless it the Hebraic way. When the Corpus Christi was raised at Mass, she always turned away from it. The most damaging testimony comes from Violante Ferrer, Constanza's old Christian neighbor. She recounts the ritual she observed at the naming ceremony. I've heard that her sons were baptized the Judaic way. What I can tell you is that Constanza's mother prayed while standing and turned towards the wall like the Jews in the presence of everyone. And Constanza didn't say anything. October 19, 1484. The Inquisition issues a citation compelling Constanza de Perpignan to appear. She cannot be located. But Constanza is spotted by a familiar, one of the Inquisition's network of informers in Zaragoza's Church of San Anton from the testimony of Juan de Herrera. I saw Constanza de Perpignan the day before the citation, inside the church of San Anton. I was sent by the bailiff of the Holy Inquisition to see if she was there. And when I saw her, I ran to tell the bailiff. I told him, and we ran together to the church of San Anton, and the bailiff looked for her everywhere, but we did not find her. Later, I heard that she had hidden in the sacristy of the church, and then I heard that the accused had escaped for fear of the Inquisition. Constanza and her daughters escaped the Inquisition, leaving the men in her family behind. Others will be less fortunate. The people of Zaragoza gather to witness the Inquisition's most important ritual, the auto de fe, the act of faith ceremony. Many of the condemned are prominent conversos who only weeks earlier ran the city government. For Sinfa and her daughter, it will be the most tragic day of their lives. Now, Zaragoza will witness its first public display of the awesome power of the Inquisition. The act of faith ceremony, designed to strike the fear of God into all who witness it.
the Inquisitors sentenced the convicted heretics one by one. Now they wear the San Benitos, the cloak of shame, and the tall conical caps called Corazas. Some will be exiled. Some are sent to serve as galley slaves. Some get life imprisonment. But those who wear the black San Benitos are condemned to death. The Inquisition operates on a spiritual plane. It turns the condemned over to the state for execution. Families and friends are forced to watch their loved ones being incinerated before their eyes. But to some, the downfall of the Conversos is cause to celebrate. One witness recorded. Now that the fire has been lighted, it will burn to the last stick. Burn until every Judaizer is dead, and there remains no one over the age of 20 who is touched by that leprosy. Constanza de Perpignan will burn today in effigy. The consequences for her eldest son, Pedro, and her husband, Manuel de Almazan, are the same as if Constanza herself had been burnt. The Inquisition will confiscate all the worldly goods of the families of the condemned. The royal treasury will take its cut of the spoils. Jacob Abankuka is convicted of heresy for his secret Jewish wedding. The black San Benito Jacob wears is the sign that he is beyond hope. In its first five years, thousands of people are purified in the fires of the Inquisition. According to one Spanish historian, within a century, the Inquisition will touch the lives of more than 15% of the population of Spain. Alta de Fe was an act of penance. Literally, it means an act of faith. And it was a foretaste of hell. It was a visible foretaste uh, of the fact that their souls would be condemned forever. Again, it was a cautionary kind of thing. Sinfa converts to Christianity. At least she goes through the motions. Her daughter is also baptized. But when they get home, Sinfa washes the church's holy water from her daughter's head to remove all traces of the baptism.
She continues to live as a Jew for the next two years. Then she is denounced and thrown again into the cells of the Inquisition. This time there is no reprieve. Sinfa Kasavi is condemned. She remains defiant to the very end. From the transcript of Sinfa Kasavi. You are the ones who are lost and cheated. And us, the fortunate one, let the angels of Moses guard me. And don't call me Juana. That is not my name. My name is Sinfa. The power elite of Aragon are predominantly conversos, and they grow desperate. They include the renowned jurist Jaime de Montesa, the chief justice of Zaragoza, Francisco de Santa Fe, son of the firebrand priest Jeronimo de Santa Fe, Manuel de Almazan, father of Pedro de Almazan and husband of the condemned Constanza, all treasurers, financiers, even knights. The conversos send an appeal to the king protesting that this is a kingdom of Christians, that there are no heretics in the realm, and that heretics in any case should be approached with warnings and persuasion, not force. If there are so few heretics, as is now asserted, there should not be such dread of the Inquisition. It is not to be impeded, be assured that no cause or interest, however great, shall be allowed to interfere with its proceedings. February 1485. Ferdinand responds with an order to all his officials in Aragon, asking them to raise arms and help the Inquisitors. The Conversos try everything to stop the Inquisition. Legal arguments, appeals to Rome, petitions to the Catholic monarchs, but nothing works. The Inquisition's net is fast closing on the high and mighty. Even Jaime de Montesa, the Chief Justice of Zaragoza, will find no protection under the law. He is denounced by a nocturnal visitor, from the testimony of Garcia de Jalez. I went there at night many times. I was having an affair with the maid. Sometimes we talked and made love in the lower level of the house of Senor de Montesa. I heard the converted Jews meeting to put together some money to find a way of stopping the Inquisition. I saw many of these converted Jews gathered with Montesa in his house. September 15th, 1485. Inquisitor Pedro Arbuez will take the first step towards sainthood. The Inquisitor Pedro Arbuez is the most feared man in Zaragoza, the man with the full powers of church and state, of life and death at his fingertips. He's had death threats. Now he wears a steel cap and a coat of mail under his robes for physical protection. The scourge of Zaragoza is a devout man, a graduate of Divinity College in Bologna. He asks for divine guidance. What he gets is a knife in the neck, the one area not protected by armor.
Inquisitor Pedro Arboez dies of his wounds exactly 48 hours later. Nearly four centuries later, Rome will make the assassinated Inquisitor a saint. The Arboez assassination is a unique event. Uh, it's the only time, really, when a group of converts uh, organize to uh, assassinate a high Inquisition official as a way of trying to prevent the Inquisition from being established in their area. And it fails. October 17th, 1485. One month after the assassination of the Inquisitor, the Inquisition arrests the distinguished jurist Jaime de Montesa. He is interrogated two days later. The notary records Montessa's denials. He denies having given or received any money, neither now nor at any time. And he denies being ever in attendance in meetings during which the death of the Inquisitor was discussed. And he said that in the case of the death of Pedro Abues, only a crazy and desperate heretic could do such a thing. For someone to jeopardize all the conversos is a huge betrayal. Jaime de Montesa is sent back to his cell. He will stay there for the next 22 months. The laws of the kingdom are suspended in the hunt for the assassins of Pedro Aguas. Vidal Durango, the man who first stabbed the Inquisitor, is the first to be captured. Durango is tortured. He confesses. Money was offered. He gives names, implicating all the leading conversos in the conspiracy. In a succession of autos de fe, 64 people burned the assassination of the Inquisitor. The leaders of commerce and industry, the city government and the royal administration are decimated in the purge. Why were they punished so severely? Well, of course, obviously, they had committed treason. They had attacked a royal representative, a man appointed directly by Ferdinand himself. They were attacking royal authority in the Crown of Aragon, and Ferdinand was not going to stand for it. Pedro de Almazan, whose mother Constanza has been burned in effigy, is among the conversos caught in the dragnet. The tribunal examines Pedro to see if he is circumcised. Then he is thrown into a cell where he will be left for the next two years. August 10th, 1487. After 22 months of incarceration, the aged jurist Jaime de Montesa is interrogated for the second time. Tortured on the strapado, a device designed to cause excruciating pain as the victim's arms are dislocated. The notary describes the proceeding. During this torture, the said Senor Montesa was pulled up with the rope of about six hands above the ground, and then he stayed in such torture for the time of three prayed cradles, more or less. De Montesa tells the Inquisitors what they want to hear from the transcript of Jaime de Montesa. The only solution we saw was to kill the Inquisitor. It took a long time to hire the right people. We paid them 800 florins of gold to kill the Inquisitor. Once Arbuis was killed, I met with the others. They were pleased. The Inquisition has its case against de Montesa. 
it's a mistake to torture people. However, torture was regarded as a perfectly justified, legitimate uh, way of, of uh, uh, producing evidence, and it was therefore legally justified. August 20th, 1487. Jaime de Montesa is condemned Jaime de Montesa. for charges that have nothing to do with the assassination of Pedro Arguez. We consider true that the said Jaime de Montesa, being a baptized Christian, converted to the Jude rites and ceremonies because he praised the laws of Moses and because he bought meat with his mother in the butcher shop of the Jews because he ate Jewish food, bread without yeast at the time of Passover, and because he attended Jewish weddings, and because it is suspicious to be circumcised. Jaime de Montesa is beheaded. One of the outcomes of the Arbues uh, uh, affair was that the church and the monarchy together exerted such power that no uh, uh, challenges to the Inquisition uh, ever succeeded after that. Juro y declaro de todo corazón que creo que la ley de Jesucristo, nuestro Señor, Young Pedro de Almazan gets off lightly. He agrees to abjure, to renounce his faith and accept Christ. He is sentenced to exile, a fate that lies in store for all his people. At the end of the 15th century, the monarchs are about to achieve their goal of one state, one religion. It becomes intolerable to accept the presence of the Muslims in the south. They crank up the war against Granada. January 2nd, 1492. After years of warfare, the Catholic monarchs complete the Christian reconquest against Granada. Ferdinand and Isabella take possession of the great Moorish palace, the Alhambra. It is an extraordinary time in history. Christopher Columbus, a mariner from Genoa, is there to seize the moment. Flush with victory, Isabella decides to back his expedition. Columbus gets the title, Admiral of the Ocean Sea. It is an opportune time for the Inquisitor General. Tomás de Torquemada proposes the final solution, the expulsion of the Jews. Majesty, you know very well how determined I am to eliminate the heresy from your kingdoms. But this task is impossible to finish as long as there will still remain a single Jew on your lands. A delegation of highly placed Jews appeals to Isabella and Ferdinand in a desperate effort to cancel the Edict of Expulsion. They remind the King and Queen of the loyalty of the Jews, of the 1,500-year history of Jews in Iberia, of how the Jews fought in the royal armies against the Muslims and financed the war. But Isabella does not relent. Do you believe that this comes from us? The Lord hath put this thing into the heart of the King. At the height of her leadership, bravery, and determination, Queen Isabella becomes the most powerful piece in the chess game. She will be the inspiration for the figure of the queen in modern chess. Ferdinand and Isabel were defining the new state as a religiously unified, uniquely Christian, uniquely Catholic uh, uh, organization. And that really spent, uh, among other things, spelled the end of the Jewish presence. April 30th, 1492. Across Iberia, in towns and villages, people gather to hear the royal proclamation. The Jews are ordered to leave the country in three months. They can convert to Christianity and stay, or sell their homes and leave. They can take personal property, but not mules, gold, silver, jewelry, or precious metals. Every Jewish home is inventoried by agents of the Inquisition and the Crown. In desperation, families must dispose of all they own, 
at fire sale prices. The expulsion was a form of ethnic cleansing in terms of a group becoming less popular, less accepted in the society, the wider society turning against that group, excluding that group from trades, professions, regions, areas, making it difficult for that group to survive, and finally expelling the group. Across the land, Jews visit their cemeteries to pay their respects to their ancestors for the last time. The expulsion coincides with the fast of Tisha B'Av, the saddest of Jewish holy days, a fast to commemorate the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. For the Jews of Spain, it is the beginning of a new diaspora. Isabella and Ferdinand never see the full impact of the forces they unleash. They leave a legacy of empire and of an institution that will keep Spain in its grip for more than 300 years. Wherever the Spanish flag is planted and the people's riches are plundered, along with the men in robes, follows the holy office of the Spanish Inquisition. Mm -hmm.